Hey everyone, I'm Chef Dennis and welcome to Around the Kitchen Table. Uh, I hope everyone's recovered from their Thanksgiving holiday and you've eaten a lot of turkey and a lot of all the sides and uh, you've slept a lot probably because of all the tryptophan in turkey. I know I tried using that as an excuse but my wife said, oh you're just going to lay down then anyway so uh, it didn't work for me. So Susan, how are you doing and how was your first Thanksgiving in the house? Yeah, hi Chef, how are you? Uh, it, was, it was really great. It was everything I hoped it to be, uh, it would be, you know, which means, uh, you know, to continue what was typical for us in terms of the food and so on and so forth. And, and the reports I got from my family who are, as you know, the worst critics are that it was, you know, a record delicious Thanksgiving and a great vibe and everything went great and I was lucky to have this um, oven which is a convection oven and oh, I had to tent it after a while because it got so rich and brown and uh, you know delicious rich brown drippings and so it was all good. That sounds good. It was but good. How about yours? How was yours? Well, mine was very good. You know, it was a little bit of a new experience for me since I'm now gluten free, and I I didn't really do much different because I, I made a different stuffing for me. I made the regular, but honestly, everything else except for the gravy was already gluten free. There wasn't any flour. Uh, I, I made a, a crisp, an apple crisp, and I decided to go against a pie, and I just made a big thing of that and. I had gotten someone had told me to use sorghum flour instead of a mix, and that would make a better crisp topping. And they were right, uh, so that came out pretty good. Uh, gravy, you couldn't tell it was not, you know, it was a gluten-free flour, and my stuffing was pretty tasty. In fact, some of the people like tried that and liked that too. So, all in all, it was a nice thing. And I did, I didn't brine my turkey. I don't know why. I just somehow couldn't find the time to do it. It's not like I was doing any a whole lot else. But it just kind of slipped by me. But I did stuff the breast with butter, and I roasted it upside down. And that's the first time I've actually roasted it upside down because usually I have it stuffed, and I just don't want to bother. There's that's so much else going on. That's funny. You know, I, I did all of that. I brined it, and then I think last week you said, which I did, um, then for another, I don't know, 18 hours or whatever, I took it out of the brine was already in it for 24 hours, took it out of the brine and air chilled air it. Mm -hmm. Air chilled it. So, you know, that going forward then it had a nice, it was going to have a nice crisp. Um, but a, a nice, you know, crispy crust, mm -hmm. uh, crispy skin. Yes. But what did you just say? I was just going to respond to what you just said. And I, I turned thought. it and I cooked it upside oh, down. Oh, I almost did. I. It's funny, I thought of you because I was putting it in the oven and I said, do I dare do it upside down? You know, maybe not this time. But let me ask, I thought of you because, and I was going to uh, uh, send you a note. Let me ask you this because coincidentally the rack I had did not fit my roasting pan well. So what happened was it was slanted like 30 degrees, slanted top to bottom in the pan. So what ended up happening was I said, oh, let me, based on no theory at all, let me put the bigger, heavier breast side of the turkey down the slant and the smaller end up, and maybe things will grab, <laughs> move toward that, you know, the juices will move toward that end. What do you think? I think it may very well have done that. It was kind of like a, an inversion table for a turkey, maybe. You know, it was like letting everything sl flow downhill. It couldn't have hurt it. Let's put it that way. And uh, the one thing I noticed, I actually cooked it for about an hour and a half upside down, and that was probably the moistest breast, turkey breast I've ever had oh, in a turkey. really? Surprise me. Now, I, you know, when they said about roasting upside down, being wary, you don't get uh, the great marks on it. So I, I took some carrots and made like a little um, wedge on each side to keep it propped up a little bit so it wouldn't lay real flat on, on the grate. And I had my glove out and I didn't stuff it. Uh-huh. I stuffed it after I flipped it over though and I stuffed it with my gluten-free stuffing hoping that that would you know help the flavor of the stuffing a little bit which it did 
But I, I let it cook for an hour and a half, so it was nice and hot all the way through. We didn't have a slow heat up on it, which would cause bacteria problems. So, you know, I just it was pretty easy. And again, it was only a 15 pound turkey. So, I mean, I, I had the glove, picked it up. Yeah, flipped well, that's it. a good size. Yeah, it's a normal size for, you know, for a regular family. Uh, but, you know, it flipped real easy, and then I just stuffed it real quick, popped it back in the oven, and it was actually done. It was done in about three and a half hours at 300 degrees. Uh, I had it in there. So, okay. Yeah. Oh, you know what? That might be the secret. I did 325 with a convection oven, which means it's faster and whatever. Uh, you know, maybe during the year, maybe I'll experiment with yeah. a uh, 300 in convection. Yeah, make another Something turkey. Like plenty of time. It's always good up until about summertime. Then you don't want to think about turkey. Uh, but yeah, give it a try and, and try it upside down just for fun. It, but it could have also been I put about uh, four tablespoons of butter under each breast. So, I mean, in between the skin, I loaded it up pretty good. Wow. Didn't make any compound, I just loaded it. So there was extra fat in it then, too. Yeah, I had some herbs, so I chopped the herbs really, you know, mushed it all up and then did the same and then put it under there. So I don't yeah. know. I don't know. So anyway, so now I mean, we still have some leftovers, and we've been, you know, just using any excuse to, you know, enjoy them. Well, we've been making sandwiches, and we're about sandwiched out right now. We, you know, we did that. We had a, a hot turkey dinner one night too, and Lisa's got some for school. But you know, we we really, since it was a small turkey, and we had some people over, we didn't have that much leftover like we usually do, and that's a that's a good thing. Uh, we had enough. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to show you how to make kind of a pot pie. And, you know, it doesn't have to be a pot pie. It could just be like a turkey stew and you don't even need to put it in a shell. I did put a, uh, a recipe up there for making your own crust. But quite frankly, at this stage of the game, if, I, if you don't have time, buy a pre-made one at the grocery store. I think they even sell them in the... In the um, where the biscuits are and everything rolled up. Uh, and I think I even saw there was some uh, gluten-free dough there too. So I mean, there's all kinds of options to save you time and trouble and just to get a nice dinner on the table. So we're going to start very simply by making a base. And I'm going to throw some butter in here because we're also going to be making a roux. Oh, okay. Yes, I did. I did that, the, that for my gravy. I mean, totally separate type of thing. And it was, uh, you know, it's worthwhile doing. It's important to do. Yeah, you know, the root helps a lot of people. I tell you, I know I saw Giada, and uh, she was on with Martha Stewart, and they were making a gravy, and Martha had made a slurry, which is basically a thinner roux. You know, you just mix your fat with the butter in a liquid form. I mean, in, in a restaurant, we had three ways of tightening things up. One was a classical roux, which we cooked, one was the liquid slurry that you would pour in, and a third was actually um, a roux that we would take that we weren't using as cook, and we would we would roll it up into little balls, and we would have roux balls around. So if you needed to tighten stuff up, you could throw a roux ball in there. Okay, and hey, let me interrupt everything now and tell you that you look fantastic. I don't know if I remember seeing that. Um, what do you call it? Chef's shirt, chef's, you know, with your name on it? Am I, am I forgetting well, it? Or? It's, it's, what I wore, it's what I wore the first half of our, the first half of the season. Okay. Uh, then I got the colored ones and I haven't worn it since. Uh, okay, so I'm not that crazy. Yeah, but okay. I think it goes well with my silver hair, you know, the black. It hair. does. So I was, I was thinking that when I put it on. So yeah. now I'm just going to dump in all my vegetables. Uh, that I'm going to use in here. I've got some onion. I've got a, a mirepoix. I've got onions, celery, carrots. And then I'm also going to add in some diced potatoes and some mushrooms. So I've got a nice complement of vegetables going here. And you know, this could basically, like I said, it could be a stew, it could be a pot pie, it could be a soup. I mean, depending on how thick you want it to be. Uh, you know, and it can have a myriad of other vegetables in it. So this has got to cook for a while. So I know you were talking about uh, some things that you could do or if things didn't go right in your kitchen. So you've got some 
tips you'd like to share with us now is a good time. Absolutely. You know, I, I, something I should have mentioned last week, but maybe you can reflect back a little bit, our, our viewers, and that is how did your kitchen function for you? And whether you're thinking about a remodel or, or a facelift, or there are just maybe some uh, light functional things you can change, it's really worthwhile to think about how your kitchen functioned for you in three different ways. And one is in terms of prep, how, uh, you know, and, and I'll go through that in terms of entertaining and in terms of cleanup. So, in terms of prep, you know, you may want to look at your countertops. Did you did you have enough counter space? And if you if you feel you didn't have enough counter space, can you can you fix that by, you know, decluttering by decluttering your counter space and just rethinking where you put things on your counter and and what you really need on your countertop because that's that space that real estate that you know counter space is so precious and sometimes what happens is we get into uh, we get into habits and we think we have to have these certain things on our countertop uh, we need them we use them but maybe you know you should look at it with a fresh pair of eyes and a fresh perspective and see what you really need on that countertop because remember we have a whole second tier of holidays coming in December and and it's really worth it to take stock and you know think about what worked for you and you know and that and again in terms of prep how do your appliances function under pressure do you have adequate power and flexibility for your burners you know that might uh, you know do you have an electric uh, do you need a new range do you have an electric uh, coil range, you may want to think about induction. It's still electrical power, obviously, but if you don't have the option to have gas, then I would seriously recommend you have induction. You think about induction, which gives you uh, increased safety and the same speed and power as, uh, as, as gas. So, Chef, I'm going to bring up these other two things as we go along, and let's get back Okay. Do we do we have more time, or do you? Oh, no, we're fine. Uh, I just salted and peppered the vegetables, and you know you can see there's not a lot of fat in here. I did put a, a substantial amount of butter in, but there's not really that much. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to build a small roux right on top of this, and I have my flour. I'm going to put that in. Now I'm just going to blend it in, and it's going to get cling to that little bit of butter that's in there. So I'm going to make a base. I want to turn my heat down too because I don't want it to burn while I'm doing this. So no lumps. You won't have lumps doing it that way, huh? Well, no, hopefully. I mean, usually, I mean, this is how I make. I would start a cream soup only with not this much, you know, vegetable. But since I'm doing this really quick and I want to keep it in one pan, and I'm just going to let it toss around a little. Get a little heat into it. I'm not going to worry as much about it cooking right here as much as it's just absorbing all the liquid, I mean all the butter. And then I'm going to, I have some stock, and I'm going to add some stock to it. Now my stock is not hot. Uh, it's generally a good idea to have it hot when you add in because it gives you a better idea of how much you really need because it'll interact with the, with the roux right away. So when it's not real hot, you want to, Give it some time to absorb without pouring it all in, in case you have too much. Yeah, exactly. You certainly don't want it too too runny, too thin. And you know, if it is though, it's not a hard fix. If if you're ever running a situation where your soup, your gravy's not thick enough, just get a little small pan out, melt some butter in it, mix some flour into it and get your little roux made up again, and then it can be a little bit on the loose side, and then just pour that in to whatever you need thickening. And that'll, you know, there's always a way to re-thicken it. There's always a way to re-thin it. So you just want to take your time, though, and try and get it right. So let's put some more stock in. And, and I love that you added mushrooms. I, I, you don't always see mushrooms, but the, I, this mushrooms have that savory sort of, uh, you know, taste and texture. And you know, mushrooms are a good substitute for protein, for meat. And you know, they fill you up, 
they fill up, they help the plate be more full. And generally, like, we, we eat way too much protein as a culture, and it's good to cut back on it a little bit. And, you know, you don't need quite as much meat in there if you're using some mushrooms to fill up the space. Too. Plus, they're, they're flavorful. Yeah, yeah, they are. And there's so many opportunities for different mushrooms and, you know, organic carrots mm -hmm. and things like that. And this is all organic in here. I have organic carrots, organic celery, organic onions. And i got to say, I got them all at BJ's. They have all oh, organic wow. vegetables there now at, at a really good price. And I, I purchased them all there. So it's been pretty pretty good for me and helping me. And organic potatoes as well has helped me be true to organics when they're uh, priced better. Now, what kind of onions? So are they white or yellow? They are yellow onions, I believe. Okay, why would, when, when and where, I see these beautiful white onions in my market, and I don't know where or how or why to use them. Is it just a direct substitute? Yeah, white or, white or yellow is fine. Uh, you know, the big thing is uh, people love Vidalias. They love sweet onions. So, you know, those are real popular on the market right now, and people are always looking for those. They don't seem to have quite the bite that a regular onion has, and there's tons of variety of sweet onions out. But when you're looking for organic, you know, there's not always as many choices with potatoes or with onions. And, you know, some people are saying, well, the organic potatoes and onions are really not that bad. They don't spray those fields as much. But I had always thought, you know, if it's buried in the ground, that that wouldn't be a good thing. So, But, you know, they, they may not be as bad. I know sweet potatoes are safe, non-organic. They're on the clean 15 list. Okay. Okay. That's good to read. That's a good reminder. And mushrooms are safe. Mushrooms are on the clean 15. Um, eggplant is, I believe. Uh, raspberries. You know, the dirty dozen are apples. Tomatoes, especially cherry tomatoes, strawberries. Uh, those are some of the things that are that are really you really want to try and buy organic when you can. Grapes, you know, when you can, you know, it's you do what you can do. You know, if you slip up a time or two and you just can't pay it, you know, that's okay. But do what you can to be more proactive for your health. Mm -hmm. so this is pretty much, you know, it's not done, but it's you know it's got everything in it. You saw again how quick that was. Now I'm going to dump in my turkey, and I, I have whole turkey meat, and I did chop it up just a little bit, just so the pieces, you know, you don't want to ever have something so big in your stew, your soup, your any kind of dish that you're making, that when you put it in your mouth on your fork, it's too much. So when you're making this kind of a dish, the idea is everything needs to be bite-sized. Okay, so this is pretty much... Done. I have to season it a little bit. I'm going to put a little more poultry seasoning in it. And oh, poultry seasoning. Good. Good, good. Yeah. Um, you one little trick that I would do. Now, see, you look at the color, and the color's okay, but it's, it's a little brown. I mean, either I want it a little darker brown or I want it a little lighter. So all I'm going to do is I'm just going to put a little bit of cream in it, just a tad, just to change the color. Now you could use a little yogurt, you could use a little sour cream, half and half. But I just want to change the color a little. Now as it cooks down, this won't be quite as white as it is now. It's going to darken up a little bit. So just to brighten, to sort of brighten it up a little bit. Yeah, just to make it look a little light. Yeah. You know, in some instances, I like things like when I do a marsala, I like them to look a little darker. So I might put a little color, you know, a little caramel color in, a little kitchen bouquet, or caramelize some sugar myself and add that in, or caramelize some vegetables to get color off of those. Well, you know, I usually cheat by using the um, the gravy master. Yes, that's and I, I didn't have to do that this year, and luckily, because in my new house, I, I, I didn't bring it with me, um, but because uh, I had nice, rich, dark, you know, juices, but uh, that's always a good good way to cheat if you have to. Absolutely. So this is basically done. Okay, now I'm just gonna let it it's gonna let it simmer. It's done, it's not done. It needs to simmer for about 
a good half hour, 20 minutes to a half an hour. Let everything build up. Let this, it's still, a, it's a little bit loose, so I want it to thicken up just a little bit. Remember, you can always thin it out if it gets too thick. So I've got it on a medium to low, more to low temperature. And I'm going to let it simmer, then I'll taste it and re-season it, see if it needs anything else. And then, once it's done... That looks great! I have these little pie shells, and you can either put it in a little pie shell, you can do individuals, this would be an individual, or you could do more of a, a casserole dish, if you like, and fill it. And then, like I said, get those pie shells from the store, or roll them out, or make yourself a fruit, or don't use one at all, serve it over egg noodles. That was all. I mean, and look at, look at your, your dish, and look at my fireplace, and, I, you know, I mean, this is comfort food. Absolutely. You know, I need to make that, pull up a chair by the fire, and, you know, just enjoy it. Now, I have one other real quick one to do. If you have leftover stuffing, and you have leftover, let me see if I can get this, change, turn this off. I don't know. Stuffing, I think, is usually tough to be left over for too long. Well, I always tend to make too much. All right, that's just what I do. Oh, yeah, I do too. I so do too. Have leftover stuffing. And then what I did, now usually I grind this up, but I didn't grind it up this time. I just finally chopped the turkey meat because I really don't like the texture of the like really ground turkey. I wanted to have it a little more visible, and this is the first time I'm trying this, so you know I may not like it that way. I may go back to the ground, but I think having it a little bit more visible is going to be better. And all I'm going to do is I'm going to mix this all together a little bit. I mean, and the stuffing already has all the flavors in it, and it has the seasonings in it, has the poultry seasoning in it, has a, it's all there. Got onions in it. It's got celery yeah. in it. Okay, so here's an easy way to do. Now, right here, just like this, you could form up some patties, and you could just bake them. Okay. Oh, you're gonna bake them? I thought you would sauté them. Cool. You can do either way. If you don't want to sauté, okay. them, you can bake them. All right. But and if if it's too dry, then what I would do is I would add a little bit of gravy to it. Ah, oh, I have some nice. pre gravy, so I would just throw a spoonful of gravy in, or whatever you need, just to get a little bit more moisture into it. So here I'm using, and I'm going to serve them with gravy, and my leftover cranberry. But here I'm doing is just adding, you know, instead of throwing an egg in there or anything else you might want to throw in there. And now, what would you think about adding some uh, raw mushrooms to oh, sure. release some moisture? I wouldn't add raw. I would okay. I would saute them. Okay. You don't want them to release that much moisture. And really, when you cook something that way, it never really cooks properly. You have to sweat a vegetable down, and just throw like if I threw raw onions in here, if I was going to saute it, it'd have some chance. But if I'm just going to bake it, and like right here, this is a nice patty. If you want to shape it into an old-fashioned cone like we used to do in the diners. You know, you can you can have fun with it. If you want to saute it, you can dredge it in a little flour real quick and just drop it in a saute pan. Wow, that looks fantastic. Pot. All these years, I never thought of doing something like that. I mean, it's so easy mm -hmm. and fun and different. Well, you know, that was one of the things. You know, I try I try to make things as simple as possible because when I was working full time, I didn't have time. And you know, there's you look at leftovers and you think, well, why does it have to be so difficult? And then I, I was just thinking, you know, everything's in that stuffing already. And this was a really nice moist stuffing. So it worked well. It didn't need much gravy. And I used to when I first started, I used to make a cream sauce and bind it with the cream sauce. And I went, you know, I got gravy left over. <laughs> I don't need to do that. Just mix the gravy, because I always make too much gravy too. That is so, it's it's just brilliant and easy. I love it. I love it. I mean, there's no, who wouldn't, who wouldn't love that? And it's tasty. Yes. Well, these are glutenful, so I won't be eating these, but Lisa, this is one of her favorites, so she'll have uh, 
croquettes, and these are basically turkey croquettes. Uh, and again, and I like seeing the turkey meat throughout them. It changes them up. It's not because sometimes I get the ones when we were out, and you get the croquette, and the the meat is like really finely ground, and it's got this mouth feel to it. Yes, the, the yeah, flavor is yeah. good, but it's just this just doesn't eat as well as you know it could. So yeah. let's see how these eat. I, I think they'll be kind of nice, uh, yeah. a little different, and again rustic. You know, sure. something like this looks looks like what it's supposed to be. You know, it's turkey and it's stuffing mixed together into a croquette. So nice. You know, I have a couple more tips mm -hmm. to talk about when we're talking about uh, entertaining. How does your kitchen function for entertaining? Because there are different ways your kitchen needs to function. Like I said, one is prep, entertaining, which is socializing. You know, everyone ends up in the kitchen, don't they? And and what happens in your kitchen? Do you have a bottleneck? I know in my old kitchen I had a bottleneck where it was a six foot span where you had the uh, you had a few different appliances and more than one person would kind of you know collide. So be aware, look at the traffic flow as you are entertaining over the holidays or even during weeknights. Look at where people move, how people move. If you're thinking about remodel or even thinking about moving. Uh, different parts of the kitchen, even where the mixer, where you operate the mixer or things like that. Uh, so how is the traffic flow? Do you have good accessibility to say um, nicer glasses if you don't have a you know a hutch type of piece of furniture, barware, uh, ca preserved counter space for you know, a beverage center or bar area, that type of thing, special classes, and even even serving utensils. You know, you want to be organized when you're entertaining and, and to allocate and visualize where how you want to serve if you have a, especially in small spaces, when we're talking about small spaces, then your kitchen has to do double duty. So it's really worthwhile to rethink, refresh, look at, Look at where you expect people to move to and and put things in proximity so that maybe they're not well within the kitchen and you know being on top of you, but um, you know, but they can access what they need to uh, access. Also, uh, also, for entertaining purposes, look at the decorative layer. Do you have a bunch of small items? We talked about cleaning the countertops. What about decorative items? Do you have a whole bunch of little collections and they're all dusty and whatever? Take a fresh look. Probably edit. Edit your collections. Edit the decorative layer. Maybe use uh, fewer, larger pieces. You know, we always hear less is more as a design uh, statement, and that's very, very true. So, uh, you know. Take a look again with a fresh pair of eyes of what your kitchen looks like decoratively and functionally. And I just threw a couple in there. Oh, yeah, oh, in the pan? Yep. Good. So I'm sautéing a couple up just to give you guys an idea of how they would do. I just was dropped them in a little flour just to just so I'd have a little crust around them. Uh, oh, nice. And it's actually a gluten-free flour. That's all I have in the house for flour now, but. And I'm just going to let them brown up, and you could finish them in the oven. So if you have these, you could form all your patties, uh, saute them a little bit, put them in the refrigerator, let them chill, and freeze them. And then when it's time for dinner, uh, put them in a Ziploc bag. Once they freeze hard, just pop a couple out, because one of these would be one or one and a half of these would be more than a ha enough for a dinner if you're having a nice, vet some vegetables with it too. i tell you what was funny was, Nobody but Lisa and I eat the coleslaw. We're also always used from the Northeast having coleslaw for dinner with our turkey, and everybody else just kind of looked at it. Yeah, no, that's not a tradition that uh, for me, from my neck of the woods. So, but but you know what? I mean, you know, people have different traditions, and is that something you've always served? Yeah, yeah. Even before I met her, I think uh, I always had. We always had coleslaw. It was just, I don't know what it is. It's just, yeah. It was just the normal with dinner. But, wow. but it was everything else went well. And you, know, you were talking about serving and using your space. Uh, as I'm get, I had everything ready in the oven and timed. And as I'm looking at the table and this, the five of us that were going to be there around it, because we don't have a real big table, I said, 
there's not going to be any room, so I decided to use all this room I have with my other island for a buffet, and I just set everything up on that. You know, you just reminded me of something, Chef. Uh, you know, in this new kitchen I have, I'm st I, I realized all of a sudden I did not have room for all my kitchen stuff because I was still kind of moving in and whatever. So you know what I did? And and this is so this is a the example of being flexible. I ordered a cart mm -hmm. uh, that's about three feet by eighteen inches deep by three feet high from Amazon. One of those like gourmet um, uh, like stainless steel. It wasn't stainless. It was a coated chrome. But you know that yeah. shelf material. Yeah. I mean, it was seventy nine dollars, and it's on wheels. And when I don't need it, I can use it in another room. I could use it in the garage. But carts in kitchens in small oh, yeah. places, a lifesaver. Yeah. Lifesaver. Yeah, you put some of your heavier items on there, like your food processor, your mixer, things like that. And you wheel it yeah. out when you're going to make something. You may not have the room on your counter or in your cabinets for all yeah. those. So carts it, are great. It can even be a bar. It could be the bar. And if you want, you know, they sell some really nice, in fact, I just got one for a tabletop here we're going to redo, uh, you know, like Lowe's or Home Depot, they sell these tabletops that you can buy. So if you get a nice tabletop and you either painted it or stained it, you know, you could put it on the top of the cart uh, for something a little fancier if you wanted to use it for some, to show off, you know, again, for a little amount of money. I'm actually thinking of getting one for when I do pictures because I like to roll it by the window where all the light is. So instead of dragging something over there and setting it up and then breaking it down. Yeah. I could just roll the cart over to the window. I love carts. There are a million. Go to Wayfair, go to Amazon. Oh my gosh, so many carts. Not expensive. All right, so here's our turkey croquettes. Beautiful. And turkey patties or whatever you want to call them. Very, very nice. Oh my gosh, they just, I mean... And again, you know, you would, uh, the sides look white. There's actually just a little flour, but if you bake them in the oven for a while, this would all go away. And uh, when you do bake something like this, put a little bit of water in the pan, too, with them so they have a little moisture to draw on so they just don't completely dry out. I always try any time I bake something to make sure there's a little water in the pan. Not cakes, of course, but anything like uh, meats. Well, they look great. And, you know, it, they look like, hey, I mean, why not even put them in the freezer, take them out, you know, mm -hmm. in the later holidays in December and pass them around as hors d'oeuvres or something. Make little little ones, maybe little yeah. nuggets. What about you that? You could actually take them. You could stuff mushrooms with them, too, and make, uh, there you go. make uh, like a turkey croquette stuffed mushroom. You know, there's all kinds of things you can do with them later on, or just make little, like you said, little balls, and you could you could bake them, fry them, whatever you want to do, and serve them as a, as an appetizer. So that, you know, there's a lot of good things you can do with them. It's simple. We didn't cause you any extra work. It's just combining some ingredients you already have. You know, serve them with your leftover cranberry sauce, and you know, and a nice green vegetable because you got plenty of starch there already, and uh, you have a you have a good dinner. Mm -hmm. it, it looks terrific. And I just want to make one other point about the cleanup. When we, we're looking at how our kitchen functions and we're thinking about cleanup, and for example, again, whether you're thinking about a remodel or, or not, uh, you know, how does your dishwasher open, for example, in relation to other appliances? That's something to, re to, to think about. Where, uh, when you unload the dishwasher, can your pieces, your glasses, your dishes, can they be in a better spot? You know, so take a look at that and, and see how, the, again, how the kitchen works under pressure. Uh, and, you know, um, organized inserts. Do you have organized inserts for drawers, for example, for knives, for all kinds of utensils? You know, around the holidays, look in your drawers again and see how it could things could be better accessed and more organized. And then, you know, everything will go a lot more smoothly. Yeah, you're more inclined to use everything that you have if it's within reach and, and, and it's accessible. So, yeah. yeah just if you think in those terms, you'll have a much better time in your kitchen. Yeah. Very good. Well, thank you for so many wonderful tips, Susan, and uh, for joining me after Thanksgiving. And next week, we'll start working on some Christmas ideas for you. 
and we'll uh, we'll see what we can come up with. If you have any ideas or things that you'd like to talk about, again, always leave them in the comments for us, and we'll do our best to get to them. And if not, yes, we'll please do. And and I mean, we've got to put cookies on the list, right? Absolutely. Got to have cookies. Although you know, I'm wondering, I may have to make some regular ones and some. And just ship them out because I can't eat them because I haven't tested too many gluten free ones okay. yet. So I will work on this, but I have a. You good know what? Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I I think I'll make the regular ones. I think maybe we'll do a show where we both. Okay. Where we we're both cooking and because I have these amazing cookie molds, and let's do that. Sounds like a plan to me. Good. All right. Well, thank, thanks so much, Chef. Beautiful dishes you made today. Thank you, and thanks for sharing your fireplace with us today. It was a, a really nice to see that going. Makes me feel very festive. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay, bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Have a great week.